Hello, everyone. I want to remember that the current session will be at TLP1, and the session name is Formulating an Intelligence-Driven Threat Hunting Methodology, and help me to give a welcome to Joe Slowick, and enjoy the session. Thank you. Laser works. There's a the title. Hi, I'm Joe. Uh, who is Joe? Uh, Joe likes Ronnie James Dio, so if you uh, followed my Twitter profile up until very recently, you would see that infatuation. Um, so currently I lead threat detection, uh, threat intelligence and detections engineering for Gigamon. You may know me from prior roles at Domain Tools and Dragos, and I also have a background in incident response and similar operations in the US government, but that's enough about me. What are we going to talk about today? Well, we're going to talk about threat hunting. Uh, we'll talk about defining what that means initially because it's good to have a set of definitions and clear understanding of what it is we'll be communicating about. And then get into an actual process of threat hunting. Uh, looking at this as a repeatable, sustainable sort of process. Talk through a couple of examples and then shift into how hunting can fuel a detection development process, which is something very near and dear to my heart. So we don't have that much time for a lot of content, so let's dive in and see what we can find. So first, hunting. We have this idea that hunting is a process that we should be engaged in, and we throw this idea around within information security circles, but we don't really spend much time typically defining what hunting means, just that it's something we should be doing. So certainly there are some definitions that are out there, typically in the form of marketing-related blogs from information security companies, but we do at least get some idea that hunting is this sort of proactive process to try to identify the intrusions that we missed the first time around. So in looking at that, hunting in brief is really just trying to identify those things that the SOC might have gotten, what might have gotten by the SOC the first time around. Identifying the adversary that made it past our defenses uh, as they were structured at a certain point in time and supporting SOC and incident response by identifying these adversaries and these unknown intrusions. And also as a way to supplement our more automated security controls and detections through a manual and very interactive process. So that seems reasonable enough as hunting conceived, but how do we actually go about this process in a way that is sustainable and can continue moving forward? Well, we start by understanding what the components of threat hunting are. And that's not just a, a concept of what questions we need to ask, who are my threat actors, what are they doing, and what are the technical observations related to those adversaries, but also understanding what visibility I have that allows me to ask questions and to try to find these adversaries. So how do I identify these threat actors, and what are the resources that I have available in order to start conducting a threat hunting uh, process? So in looking for the prerequisites for hunting, what are we talking about? So again, hunting is something we should do, but it's certainly something that we also need resources and capabilities to execute it in a meaningful fashion. So from a hunting perspective, first and foremost, in my opinion, and I have a strong threat intelligence background, so I may be biased, is understanding our adversaries. That doesn't mean understanding who they are, but rather how they operate. And we'll talk to that uh, in a bit here momentarily. But in addition to understanding who our adversaries are, we also have to have certain competencies in terms of asking questions and data or telemetry that we could use to ask questions of. And it's by combining these three perspectives that we can start developing the background necessary to conduct meaningful threat hunts. So in looking at this, we can start migrating uh, a, in a fashion from data to understanding. Of understanding first who are our threats and what are the artifacts related to their behaviors or how they operate. Uh, then based upon my threats, figure out what's my underlying visibility. How do I start identifying how these threats operate? What are the options that I have available to identify artifacts of threat actor activity? And then how do I ask questions of this data in order to reveal these artifacts of adversary behaviors? Uh, how do I query my data? Am I typing queries in Splunk, in Elk, in uh, some other sim or tool? Or am I looking through raw logs and raw data sources? And what is the scope of that and how does it relate back to the adversaries that I care about. 
Uh, so now we're starting to get into a more fundamental way of asking questions and understanding how this relates to underlying data. But let's expand this a bit further instead of just saying, oh, go understand adversaries and go ask questions in your data set. Because the problem is, is that often we're left hunting in isolation, where we have either a very narrow view of what's going on in our environment, or we just simply don't have the data sources uh, necessary to query or to uh, look for adversary activity within our environment. That's not good. So instead, we want to try to improve our visibility or at least understand what's necessary to improve the or expand the aperture of our visibility so that we can get a better sense of what's going on. Now you'll notice in this GIF that the entire room is not illuminated because we'll never have complete visibility. Uh, that would be very hard. We would probably be overwhelmed with data, but we do need to expand our scope to such an extent that we can at least begin asking more relevant questions and uh, begin linking observations of potential threat actor activity to come up with a more refined look of what's going on. Now as part of this, we might also try to develop a model. Uh, one of the things that uh, informed my thinking about this subject, and it's something that I'm trying to write a paper about as well, so stay tuned for that, but I've been delayed, so you have to wait for that a little bit longer, is uh, looking at this in a very systematic way, such as hypothesis testing, as we're uh, familiar with in various other forms of research and statistical analysis. Uh, can we also, in addition to expanding our visibility, take a perspective where we can start evaluating the questions that we're asking in a very systematic way to see if we're on the right track or wrong track, if we're asking the right questions or misleading questions, and if there's a way to evaluate our hunting hypotheses in such a fashion that we can add some statistical or other rigor to it to improve our processes over time. So if we start expanding this a little bit, what does our hunting process then begin to look like? So we know we need to understand our adversaries, we know we need data, and we know we need to have some way of evaluating this. But if we're putting together a series of steps in generating testable hunting hypotheses, we first need to understand adversary operations, then we need to understand what visibility we possess in order to look for those adversaries, but then we also need to have an understanding of fundamental risks to our organization. Because we can't just ask any question, or we certainly could, but in doing so, we're likely going to waste time and resources instead of focusing on things that, we should, that are simply important for the organization we're trying to defend. So if we start looking at these three concepts as being the integral parts of a threat hunting program, what do these look like in greater detail? Well, first, if I'm looking at hypothesis development, the central aspect of a hypothesis is that this is something that is testable. I'm asking questions that I can evaluate, that I can determine whether or not they are meaningful, impactful, actionable. So in doing this, I want to formulate questions in such a way that they are specific, you know, not just, I want to look for bad activity. Like, no, I need to identify a very specific element of bad actor operations that I'm looking for. They need to be measurable, which seems like it's obvious obvious since we're dealing with uh, data sets in this case, so that shouldn't be too big of a deal. Uh, detectable as well, if I'm formulating a hypothesis, I should be able to identify artifacts related to that question within the data that's available to me, relevant to my organization, so not looking for uh, SMS-based phishing for Android ecosystem devices if I'm running iOS uh, with an MDM solution or something like that. I want to relate these items to the environment that I'm operating in. Uh, timely, uh, related to operations and related to how the adversary is operating, so I'm not looking for activities that occurred years ago or that are artifacts of historical operations, but rather reflect the state of the now and what might be going on in my network at this time. And then finally, testable. I can evaluate whether or not the hypothesis I developed was good, effective, and if I found what I was looking for or if I didn't, I can understand why. Either that's because there really was none of the activity that I was looking for present, or I need to refine my questions and my way of evaluating them uh, to better understand and better evaluate how to get at those results. So the first component of building these hypotheses is understanding adversaries. So what threats are operating in the space that I'm operating within? So am I in the financial sector, telecommunications, medical, industrial controls, et cetera? And then understanding how the adversaries within that ecosystem operate. Uh, do I have adversaries that are using extensive living off the land techniques, they use custom malware, they uh, fish in a certain sort of way, and 
figuring out what are the fundamental behavioral aspects of these adversaries to start understanding what are the behaviors I need to start looking for within my data and the sort of questions I need to start asking. Yeah. So if I'm looking at understanding adversary operations, I have options available to me. I can look at CTI frameworks like diamond model analysis, kill chain analysis, MITRE attack mapping, et cetera. Uh, I could also focus on tools like evaluating Cobalt Strike because everyone uses Cobalt Strike, except if you were in the Ukrainian CERT session uh, just before you would have heard Impacket mentioned many times. So understanding what sort of tools and uh, capabilities, the adversaries that you care about are operating so that you're evaluating the right technologies, the right capabilities, and understanding how they function. So in doing this, we want to drive ourselves towards a intelligence-based understanding of what's going on. Not just identifying what adversaries are of interest to me, but more importantly, how do these adversaries operate? This last part is a little bit difficult. Uh, it could be valuable if we can identify what our adversaries' goals are. Are they ransomware adversaries? Are they intellectual property stealers? Are they trying to monetize our network in some other fashion? Uh, that could help direct certain efforts, uh, certainly in terms of timeliness, if I have a short time to live before the deployment of ransomware and so forth. Um, but while this is a nice to have, we really need to focus on these higher level items of just figuring out who are the threats that are of primary concern to us and how they operate on a very technical level. Anything after that is a bonus and likely very hard to get to. That also gets us into questions of attribution and so forth, and that's a completely different and very unsavory topic that we won't get into today. Okay, so we talked adversaries. We need to know who our adversaries are and how they operate. Well, just knowing how adversaries operate is insufficient to start developing hunting criteria because now I need to figure out, all right, if this is how adversaries operate, what data sets do I have available to look for artifacts related to their operation? So that includes what sensors do I have? Uh, what activity can I see? Do I have a endpoint visibility product? Do I have network visibility? Is my network visibility only ingress and egress traffic within my network, or can I see lateral movement uh, activity as well, both on the network and from a host perspective. Looking at all of these different artifacts together to start building a composite view of what adversaries look like in my environment and how that enables me to identify the behaviors I identified in previous steps to flag malicious activity that I might have missed otherwise. So in looking at visibility and telemetry, yes, you might get sold on pew pew maps and other silliness or whatnot. Uh, we don't really need to worry about that sort of thing. Really, we're talking about the nuts and bolts of security operations. So diving into your ELK instance and querying things in Kibana or a Splunk, a Q radar, a you know, pick a vendor tool, it doesn't really matter, or just grepping and searching for things on the command line and so forth. Identifying what are the data sets that are available to me and how I can interact with them in order to extract the information necessary to align observations to what I'm looking for related to adversary operations. And if we're looking at this, I'd like to emphasize that there are three pillars of visibility that we need to emphasize in security operations. Uh, host visibility, which has been very popular over the last five years through the sort of Copernican revolution of endpoint detection and response product development. But also we can't forget about things like fundamental network traffic analysis and network visibility. Again, not just ingress egress, but also identifying lateral movement and figuring out thorny questions like hybrid cloud communication and so forth. And then finally, on a more legacy basis, artifact and file analysis, which you may also refer to as antivirus or anti-malware solutions, but being able to evaluate artifacts related to adversary operations to determine their function or if they're malicious or evil or not. Ideally, we have all three of these. No one's budget is unlimited, though, so I realize that many organizations may only have artifact analysis and maybe they're doing Sysmon or something along those lines. Or they have a good firewall solution and maybe some EDR product but aren't really uh, doing much, or at least much that's sophisticated on the level of artifact analysis. So in those cases we have gaps. And gaps are almost inevitable to some extent, uh, whether we are strong in certain areas and weak in others, or just completely absent in certain fashion. So one thing that we need to do as security professionals is understand both from an operational standpoint as well as a hunting development standpoint of how we can leverage existing capabilities to make up for gaps. Can I use Zeek modules to carve out binaries from traffic streams if I don't have good host visibility to perform artifact analysis? Can I use endpoint visibility in terms of operations to make up for my lack of uh, understanding or visibility into lateral movement techniques by looking for the appropriate Windows 
operations or endpoint artifacts related to things like user interaction and remote logon activity. Again, a very complex topic. We don't have that much time to get into this in very good detail, but just looking for those opportunities to bridge those gaps where something might not be present in our environment to enrich our visibility to enable us to ask more complex questions. Finally, and I think this is the part of hunting that gets overlooked the most, is having some understanding of fundamental risk propositions to the organization we're trying to defend. Every entity should have a fairly unique profile in terms of what threats matter and how those threats can actualize themselves within our environments. And so we want to ask questions of, what does my organization do? What is the primary mission that could be impacted through a cyber or you know, similar sort of intrusion? And what are the risk scenarios associated with this activity. This is to focus our efforts so that we begin asking questions about activity that is simply important for the network in question by doing things like identifying critical assets, key network terrain, crown jewel analysis, etc., to direct our efforts to the things that are most significant and most vital to the organization's ability to continue to operate. So in looking at that, we want to emphasize priorities, because not everything is important. If everything's important, then nothing is important. So just figuring out, you know, certainly my domain controllers as part of my Active Directory instance are simply important, but is my payment processing system, my industrial control devices, my medical devices, etc. Figuring out what are the sort of keys to the kingdom and identifying what are the adversary options towards impacting those assets, and then formulating hunting hypotheses to uh, look for what are likely adversary routes to try to impact, degrade, disrupt, destroy, et cetera, those sorts of assets that would impact operations at a very significant level. So what does this look like if we're putting this all together? Well, we want to start by certainly identifying adversaries and their relevant behaviors, what risks these adversaries present to the organization, and then how those adversaries can be detected. And putting that all together gets us to a point where we can now start developing effective hunting hypotheses based upon what is potentially impacting our organization within the limits of what we can see. Now certainly we might identify gaps that need to be addressed that we can't see certain things or can't detect certain things, and this becomes the asks that we have for our leadership of tools that we need or changes in our networking environment that are necessary to close those gaps. But in an immediate sense, we now have a basic blueprint for how to put together hunting queries in such a fashion that we can start asking meaningful questions in a sustainable and repeatable fashion. So what does this look like in practice? You know, we've, you know not lots of sort of um, uh, vague concepts about understand adversaries and uh, put these together in a testable fashion. What does this look like? Oh, did that have text? Yeah, be very, very quiet. Uh, yeah, okay, anyway. Uh, so let's take a really simple example. Business email compromise. This is a threat that I think often gets overlooked in our community because it's not technically very sophisticated, but it certainly is very expensive and costly to many organizations. Well, let's look at BEC and develop a hypothesis on how BEC actors function. So we can postulate that BEC-focused adversaries will attempt to extract financial value, so the organizational value concept, uh, from the entity we're defending by trying to spoof or inject into legitimate communication channels. And we could probably identify this activity through things like email header artifacts or the lack of proper signatures and DKIM artifacts. So here we're putting together the three components we discussed. We have the value proposition for the organization. They're, they're trying to take money from us. That's a pretty simple one. They're doing so by trying to spoof uh, communications to our organization, so the adversary's behavior, what they're trying to do. And then how can we find this? Well, maybe if I start asking questions about email artifacts and doing some header analysis, I can start identifying differences between legitimate communication streams and illegitimate ones to flag suspicious or fraudulent sorts of behaviors. So here we see the, the three components put together in a systematic way. Threat is BEC, the impact is monetization, and then figure out a way to flag activity around email observables. Pretty straightforward stuff. You know, that's not rocket science or you know, any other sort of science, maybe a little scientific like or whatever in trying to put this together in a systematic fashion, but this is something we could all usefully and meaningfully do. But things can get certainly much more complex. So for example, ransomware, the other threat, uh, often more popular to talk about than BEC because it's technically a little bit more interesting, uh, maybe not as impactful from a monetization standpoint, but definitely something that all of us care about. 
So we can look at an example like this report from the DFIR report from a few months ago. Uh, slides were due, well, I was good. I had my slides in on time, so this is from a couple of months ago. Uh, but you can pretty much take this example and replace it with just about damn near any other ransomware attack out there and for this to be equally valid. In this case, we had a threat actor that was using Iced ID as a initial access, well, using phishing and then delivering Iced ID as an initial ingress vector into the victim network, and then having a very short time to live of only about three and a half hours between initial network compromise and then delivery of ransomware. That's pretty damn fast and not all that common, but tells us a uh, sense of timeliness of how we need to start asking these questions and potentially systematize how we're looking for these threats, given the potential that they could arise or deliver their impact scenarios in relatively rapid fashion. So okay, digging into uh, these guys, how do they operate? Well, looking at this, we see a variety of things. We see Cobalt Strike, ubiquitous among all e-crime actors and certainly plenty of APTs as well. But other things too, PS exec for code execution, abusing WMI for lateral movement and remote uh, code execution as well. Harvesting credentials and using remote logons and using harvested credentials to pass on to PS exec to enable that remote uh, execution as well as lateral movement. But also using tools like AD Find and Bloodhound in order to enumerate Active Directory to figure out who are my users and what are my user groups and so forth that are of interest. Compromising the domain controller in order to gain whole of network uh, control, and then using things like admin shares and scheduled tasks in order to seed ransomware throughout the network and then execute it in coordinated fashion. So a series of you know, fairly complex behaviors, but also fairly common things that we see uh, a variety of entities from e-crime actors to APTs leveraging as part of their intrusion operations. So if we can start formulating ways of asking questions about how these items function and how they relate to the overall overall adversary life cycle or kill chain, we can start developing ways of really unearthing this sort of activity within our network and trying to compensate for things that we may have missed through automated detections. So in looking for these, we want to first identify, you know, what are the things that I don't already detect? You know, it doesn't make sense to go hunt for things that I already have automated detections for because they should be catching this activity. So I want to focus on things that I'm missing otherwise. But then I want to focus on the possibilities that are available to me, what data exists and what I can see. So if I don't have very good visibility into things like how adversaries can remotely use WMI and so forth because I'm not logging WMI, it doesn't make sense to try and ask questions about that, so focus on the things that I can actually do. And then I want to look at the resources that I have in order to ask these questions, in order to adequately deploy them. Do I have the people uh, in play that can ask these questions and figure out what's going on? So one hunting hypothesis we can develop is that ransomware affiliates, uh, you know, we already have conceptualized the threat here, will utilize things like Active Directory enumeration tools such as AD Find, Bloodhound, et cetera, as part of their initial discovery phase within the network. So I'm trying to identify things early in the kill chain that are maybe a little hard to develop detections for, but that I have visibility around to look for those instances of uh, through things like uh, excessive AD-related activity through AD logs or through network detection by identifying significant amounts of LDAP queries, uh, which could be done through Snort or Suricata signatures or through Zeek scripting, to identify this precursor to adversary operations, looking for the adversary trying to do things like identify accounts of interest and uh, deploying this as a way of detecting early phase operations before we get into things like the deployment of ransomware or if we're talking about you know, a sandworm-like actor and the deployment of a uh, wiper or some other destructive payload. So just putting this together in a systematic fashion. But that's all well and good, but the thing is is that you know, it's not just execute threat hunting, magic happens, and then security is achieved. We need to do better. So how do we do that? Well, first off, repetitive threat hunting is kind of wasteful. Uh, yeah, I mean, we want to certainly do an iterative process and you can meaningfully engage and employ a dedicated hunt team, but if we are asking the same questions over and over again, we have to ask ourselves, are we just applying this Sisyphusian-like task of pushing this boulder up a hill and never really getting anywhere? So we want to develop hunting as a process that not just is valuable in and of itself, but that can translate hunts into detections, thus enabling continued security monitoring. So how does that look? 
Well, really, we're looking for threat hunting now as an input to detection engineering, a topic that I really enjoy. And in this fashion, what we want to do is first determine what's the baseline of our current detection set. What is it that I'm seeing and looking for right now? What is that baseline posture that I have for my organization? And then using hunting to supplement that baseline to look for things that are beyond the scope of what my current automated detections are looking for, asking those questions that are otherwise hard to answer. And then if I realize that there's a way that, oh, you know this hunting script that I'm putting together? It's a script. I can probably automate this in some fashion, whether as a more complex analytic or maybe there's a way that I can piece together some queries uh, in my various tools to automate this, thus building that into my detection set after I've established that it's a valid hunting hypothesis through evaluation of its results uh, and fitness to what it is that adversaries are doing. And in this way, I can start developing a virtuous cycle of hunting, filling in the gaps around my detections, and then successful hunts feeding back into the detection process so I can start automating these and improving my security coverage of the threats that are available or that are meaningful or uh, of interest to me. So this is a really short talk. It's only 25 minutes and I'm a little bit over time for questions already. Uh, the key things is that we want to understand who our adversaries are, so an intelligence-driven way of uh, developing hunting hypotheses, knowing what our visibility and the capabilities that I have as a security organization, and then leveraging these items in order to hunt for threats and improve our security posture, but not stopping there. Instead, using this development of a successful hunting process to then feed into automated detection development and detection engineering to continuously improve and enhance my security posture overall. So again, really short stuff. Uh, I will be writing up this up in the next couple of weeks and hopefully have something published by the end of August. My apologies, it's not ready for this event. So if this is a topic of interest, there'll be a deeper dive in written form later on. But to the extent that we have time right now, uh, there are a few minutes left over for questions. Thank you, Joe. There is some question. Uh, you have to go to the microphone on the right side. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Joe. Really appreciate the talk. Um, any advice or suggestions on hunting in the cloud? The data set is a bit more challenging. Operations are kind of similar across users. What do you have suggestions for, for approaching that? My answer to that is that is an excellent question and that is actually something I have my team researching right now. Um, I don't have good answers at the moment because cloud environments, it's not just a question of like hunting in the cloud, it's hunting in Azure, hunting in AWS, hunting in GCP. Uh, so. It, as far as I can tell right now, things are very solution specific, which is one, so certainly there's a diver, division between things. There's hunting in the cloud, like a virtual private server is a VPS, it operates just as a, any other device, it has logs, et cetera, you can query it that way. Like, okay, that's cool. The problem is, is that when you start getting beyond just each device in isolation to how things are, uh, nested or virtualized and, and hosted or whatever, you know, co-hosted, et cetera, that now you need to start getting into the actual cloud provider telemetry, and that's hard, <laughs> and it's kind of a pain. So that's something that I'm working on right now. I don't have a good, good answer at the moment, but I recognize that that is a pressing question and something that we need more advice on. So I, I feel you on that. I just don't have anything right now. I oh, appreciate it, thanks. Yeah. One more question? Thanks. Good presentation. Thank you. Um, one of the things that's always frustrating for me is when attackers have legitimate credentials that they've stolen from somewhere else, they sort of go invisible, it becomes a nightmare. Do you have any tips and tricks uh, for helping track down people using legitimate credentials? Yeah, credential abuse, I mean, that's common. But whether it's grabbing it from some third party leak or using Mimi cats to dump them and then just move laterally and so forth. There are strategies around this though, whether it's by developing, you know, you could apply a machine learning way of looking at this, of developing models of legitimate user behavior, even down to potentially the account or user group level to look for anomalous uh, behaviors related to, you know, like Jim is in accounting. Why is he uh, RDPing or whatever into the IT network or so forth? That's expensive though, so it's not easy to do that. 
Other ways of trying to do this that might be a little cheaper would be looking for things like uh, excessive or egregious one-to-many or many-to-one relationships for remote authentication and remote logon activity. So like, why is this one workstation attempting to use five different accounts to RDP to another? Um, and again, that's not still kind of expensive, but a little bit more realistic than trying to develop an entire model around user authentication in your environment. And then finally, you know, looking for things like abuse of or attempting to get around things like multi-factor authentication. How did SolarWinds get identified? Because someone was trying to, uh, f you know, finagle a MFA key uh, from a user that they were trying to impersonate. And so just looking for those artifacts related to account abuse can be successful uh, and potentially catch even really nasty threats that are in motion. Cool. There's one more. I will, first, Rob would be very appreciative of uh, your slideshow. <laughs> uh, and then f as a follow-on, so what happens if you have one group of users where you can't do the standardized behavior, since like I have researchers, yeah. they do a lot of things at weird times. Yeah, no, I, I feel that pain very much. So my incident response experience was largely at Los Alamos National Laboratory, which had a lot of researchers and a lot of people doing weird things at weird times, which makes a lot of that behavioral profiling frustratingly difficult. Here, things like, and, th and this is where having good network engineering and understanding how that applies to user behavior and what is possible in the environment can be very successful by having things like dedicated enclaves for different user groups and so forth and then looking for movement beyond or transitioning uh, beyond enclaves where those sort of entities should be operating. Uh, however, because most networks are flat, that's a hard one to actually do in practice. So moving beyond that, we need to look for opportunities of identifying post-auth or post-credential um, abuse activities by looking for things like, okay, uh, Cindy in the research organization is really is a night owl and will be doing weird things at two in the morning. Um, that's fine, but looking for where Cindy running something like Bloodhound or the artifacts related to certain types of very risky behavior is a higher signal item that something really weird is going on. So here, event correlation of not just relying on the anomalous user activity, but then adding that to a uh, subsequent event in the attacker life cycle and correlating those events become necessary. But again, that's also, you know, people don't like when I give talks like this because I give a lot of suggestions, but none of them are easy. The problem is, is that none of this is easy. We really need to start understanding that there isn't you know, a one-liner that's going to solve these issues and looking for ways of doing better event correlation to capture these sort of weird edge cases that you're talking about. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. Thank you again. One more question. Hi, thank you very much for the, the talk. Um, so you talk about um, uh, hypotheses and the importance of hypotheses when you do threat hunting. Uh, I was wondering, do you think it's still important, and if you call that threat hunting, to look at rare values of IP address on the proxies uh, uh, with things coming up, coming up from the EDR? I, th I think it's very relevant to do that like on a weekly basis, for example? Do you still call that threat hunting? Yes, I, I think so, as long as we're structuring it in a way, other than just saying like weird IP address of, I, of um, enhancing that uh, definition by saying, okay, seldom seen or newly observed network artifact that is associated with either a ASN or something else or whatever that is suspicious or a geographic region that is suspicious and then linked to some activity that I care about. Because depending on the network, you'll probably get flooded with lots of ephemeral connections, scans, all sorts of things that could overwhelm just looking for weird IP. But if we start enhancing that definition, so trying to formalize that a bit more, uh, like kind of how I was uh, referring to in the presentation, that could allow for something more sustainable and more actionable, as well as something that will be easier for an analyst to evaluate instead of just saying, hey, weird IP, go investigate it. Like, no, no, we have an IP address that was coming from host sailor or DigitalOcean or you know, pick a provider that you don't like for some reason, and uh, it uh, you know, attempted an RDP connection or whatever after hours. So some way of enriching that discussion to provide a more focused way of answering that question. Mm -hmm. Thank you again. I think there is no more questions, so thank you, Joe. Okay. Thanks, everyone. Uh, now there is yeah, break for lunch. Next session will be at uh, 2 o'clock. Thank you. <laughs>